So glad you joined us today. And today we're just going to read one verse out of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 7. Um, it reads, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And since it's Independence Day, we're going to talk about Independence Day for the Christian. Independence Day for the Christian. God bless everyone. God bless those in the uh, in the chat room. My brother JLC, who has placed our links. God bless your brother, brother Ham, sister Terry, sister Christy. Uh, God bless everyone, and so glad you're joining in today. Today we want to talk about the the Independence Day for the Christian. Now th that text says in Him we have redemption. I don't know what just happened, but for some reason we lost connection for a second there. <laughs> I don't know exactly what happened, but um, uh, is everybody there hearing me now good? Uh, for some reason, it I went blank on my screen here. And I I lost connection, but I think it looks like we're 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 still going. Uh, can y'all hear me now out there in the uh, in the chat room? Um, for some reason we 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 went. We lost audio. I lost audio for like I don't know, fifteen seconds or so or some. Okay, JLC say we back on. Okay, I don't know what just happened right there, but some click, and uh, I, my screen went blank. But we, we're back on. Okay, uh, we want to talk about um, Independence Day for the Christian. Now, the statement that we read in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, and according with the riches of God's grace. In him we have redemption and we are forgiven of our sins because of what he has done. Second Corinthians 1 and 9 says, Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. We have an Independence Day because of what the Lord Jesus did on Calvary. See, that's our Independence Day. Everybody always want to wait for Easter to celebrate. That's the Independence Day, though. Acts uh, chapter 10, verses 39 through 41 says, We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he became visible not to all the people but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God that is to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead who that i mean that's that, that that's some in, in and of itself they are, are proclaiming here in the book of acts that they literally ate and drank with the person in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, after he was rose from the dead. See, that's a statement right there. So somebody should have been saying, you boys are telling the lie. <laughs> because uh, we killed him and, uh, and his body is right over here. But they didn't say that. Peter is declaring in the book of Acts that not only did Jesus Christ raise from the dead, but we ate and drank with him after he was risen from the dead. I don't know about you, but uh, <laughs> that's a pretty powerful statement, if you ask me. What if you knew somebody, you said raised from the dead, that you ate and drink, and you got a bunch of witnesses to back it up? Make no mistake, we have redemption through his blood and his blood alone. There is no other name under heaven that you're going to be saved. I don't care who says it. So America is celebrating Independence Day. Uh, today, and they do it every year on the 4th of July. First, uh, the 4th of July is a celebration of the birth of a nation. It, it, it's to say we are free from the rule of our oppressors, which was Britain then, right? It also is a celebration 
of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence was signed, it was not signed actually until August the 2nd of 1776. Also, you can make a note that July the 4th is not the day the Continental Congress declared independence because that happened on July the 2nd, 1776. But we celebrate July the 4th as our Independence Day because the Continental Congress approved the final wording of the Declaration of Independence. That was July the 4th, 1776. The Christians celebrate every Easter or resurrection as the day of independence. Now, the Christian should celebrate every day as Independence Day <laughs> because he got up. We should be celebrating. Every day you wake up should be your Independence Day. You say, I'm free. I can speak freely because of what Jesus Christ has done on Calvary. That's my Independence Day. And they surely should celebrate the Lord Jesus' victory every time you attend church. Because the empty grave means his offering was accepted. Oh, yes, it was. That's what the empty grave symbolizes. <laughs> it symbolizes that it is done. It is finished. He said it on the cross. It is finished. Oh, yes, that's our Independence Day. Believers are still at war with the enemy and the devil and all his helpers. You have, the devil still is your enemy, and the devil has a bunch of workers. Matter of fact, the devil got more workers than the Lord has. But the good news is that our high priest has already guaranteed us victory. Woo, that's good news. <laughs> we already got the victory. The devil already knows what his end is. See, some of his followers, those who work for the devil, they don't realize that their end is hell. See, the devil knows this. He knows what his end destruction is. He ain't that crazy. Sad part is there's a lot of people working for the devil don't realize that they're going to get thrown in the pit of fire with him. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, the reason the non-believer wants to attack the resurrection is that it proves a victory. See, the devil knows this. And so he get his workers to attack the resurrection, even though he has no facts to back that up. If the Lord Jesus was not raised from the dead, then there is no independence day for the believer. Let me repeat that. If the Lord Jesus was not raised from the dead, then there is no independence day for the believer. You see, each one of the gospel writers talks about the empty tomb. The empty tomb is important. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> That's evidence right there. The tomb is empty. Uh, every gospel writer, uh, you get Matthew, you got Mark, you got Luke, and you got John. Everyone talks about the empty tomb. Each one tells us that he is not dead because he has risen. Matthew 28 and 6 says he is not here for he has risen just as he said. Come see the place where he was laid. Mark 16 and 6 says, and he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. Luke 24 and 6 says, he is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee. And John 20 Verses 11 through 18. Let's read what it says. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? <laughs> Uh, they, they have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Whoo, I get chills when I read that one. 
She saw Jesus standing there, but did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away. That's some kind of worship. I don't care what you say. (laughs) That Mary is some kind of worship. She's still looking for Jesus. Oh, yeah, that'll preach there. She says, uh, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I will get him. She said, wherever you put my Jesus, just let me know. Then Jesus said to her, listen to this. All Jesus had to do is say her name, and then she knew it was Jesus. Woo, my sheep know my voice. Jesus said to her, Mary, all he said was Mary. When he said Mary, the Bible says she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabona, which means teacher. Jesus says, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. In other words, the disciples are hiding. Mary is looking for Jesus so she gets the chance to see Jesus. She says, I got, he said, I got some work for you, Mary. I want you to go tell. <laughs> I want you to run and tell those uh, fellas who's hiding uh, that uh, I'm about to ascend, but I need to give a message to them. <laughs> Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the good news. I have seen the law. Woo! She said, I have seen the law. Mm, mm, mm. Come on, Independence Day. I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. Mary was the messenger <laughs> of the master. Go go tell him why they had that I'm back, <laughs> uh, that the grave couldn't hold me because it didn't have anything to hold on to because there was no sin found in me. Acts 3 and 15 says, You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Yes, we are. We are witnesses of this. So Peter is declaring that the Lord Jesus did that. But he says that the good news to the believer is God raised him from the dead. So because of his finished work, we can now quote Romans 8 and 1. Therefore. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you do not want to be condemned, you must be in Christ Jesus. Just like only those who were in the boat with Noah were the ones who were saved. See, you got to be in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? It means you are placing your trust in getting to heaven in what he accomplished on Calvary. That's why Acts 4 and 12 says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Our independence from the punishment of sin can only come through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the gospel according to John chapter 5 and verse 21, the master says, truly, truly, I say to you, whosoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come to judgment, but has passed from death to life. Woo! In order to have an independence day, you must have faith or belief in what his word teaches. And that goes back to the resurrection. I just want to read some of the verses that talk about the resurrection. Because technically speaking, you may not know how many times the Bible mentions the resurrection either directly or indirectly, because it's in there a lot. If you take out mentions of that, the the New Testament is not going to make much sense to you. Second Timothy 2 and 8 says, Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, descended of David, according to my gospel. What? According to your gospel, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. See, Paul just throw that in there. Peter just throws it in there. See, the gospel writers, they just throw it in every time almost. Ephesians 2 
uh, verses six through nine says, and God raised up, raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God. <laughs> Psalms 16 and, and 10 says, For you will not abandon my soul in shalom, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Matthew 16 and 21 says, From the time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go through Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and to be killed and to be raised up, on the third day. If you go over to the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Matthew 20 and 19 says, and I will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scrounge and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. Matthew 26 and 32 says, but after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. So if someone is saying there is no resurrection of the dead, they are calling the Bible a lie book. This is a book of lies. If there is no resurrection of the dead, if Jesus Christ has not raised from the dead, you may as well throw the Bible in the trash. And if anyone is thinking they can go to heaven, yet declare they don't believe in a bodily resurrection, then they are calling the Lord Jesus a phony. That's what they're saying in so many words. They're saying Jesus is a fraud for declaring that he was going to be raised from this grave, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. He's not talking about a spirit. He's talking about a body. Not a spiritual resurrection, but a physical resurrection. The concept of a biblical resurrection is it, 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 it should be reunite, re, reuniting a, a glorified body with the spirit. No, 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 no. See, People get this concept of, well, I believe in the resurrection, but only the spirit. That's not what the Bible teaches, though. In the gospel, according to Luke chapter 24 and verse 39, the master says to the disciples, listen to the master to the disciples. When somebody tells you that it's only a spiritual resurrection, you quote them Luke chapter 24, verse 39. The master says to the disciples, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. We should be still done with the conversation of somebody telling you about some, some spirit only being raised in Jesus, but not a, a body being raised. That's not a resurrection then. I mean, what are you talking about? What, what does this verse Luke 24 and 39 mean if it's not talking about a physical resurrection? It makes no sense. We have been given our independence because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead. We will be raised with a glorified body because he defeated death. If the Lord Jesus has not been risen from the grave, all our preaching and all our believing is in vain. Make no mistake about it. If Jesus has not risen from the grave bodily, you may as well stop preaching. You may as well stop going to church because it's all in vain, period. When some cult comes up with another way to heaven, other than the finished work of the Lord Jesus, run away. Run away. There is no gospel without the resurrection of the Lord. There is no forgiveness of sin if he has not been risen from the grave. The Apostle Paul, in that great resurrection chapter, sums it up best. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Now, brethren, and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you receive 
and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Stop right there. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is about to proclaim your declaration of independence. He says, just in case there is any confusion about the gospel I preach, the gospel you have taken a stand on, the gospel by which you are saved. So we should pay attention to what he is about to remind them on what the gospel is based on. Then he goes on to say, verse three, for what I have received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. Notice what Paul has declared as the gospel. He says Christ died for our sins. He did not die because of his sins. He had no sins and he could have lived forever. He died because of our sins. He also says that the scripture declares he died for our sins. The scripture declares that he died for our sins. In Isaiah chapter 53, starting at verse 7, it says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shares is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. Then in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says he was buried also. Isaiah 53, starting at verse 9, says he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Then 1 Corinthians 15 says, he would rise from the dead. Isaiah 53 uh, verses uh, 11 says, starting at verse 11 says, after he had, has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge, by righteousness my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquity. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercessions for the transgressors. We have an Independence Day because of what he did at Calvary. Galatians 1 and 4 says, Who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. You see, the Old Testament talks about the resurrection. Those saints of old look forward to the resurrection. In the book of Job, uh, uh, chapter 19 Starting at verse 25, it says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job is talking about the resurrection. Psalm 49 and 15 says, but God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. Isaiah 29 and 19 says, but your dead will live. Lord, their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. 
Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her day. Hosea 13 and 14 says, I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. World death are your plagues. World grave are your destruction. Psalm 16 and 10 says, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. And I could name more to point to the resurrection, but time does not permit. But the resurrection is the day of our declaration. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is our day of uh, our, our declaration of independence. Matter of fact, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, on that first resurrection Sunday is a declaration of independence for the believer. Not only did the Old Testament talk about uh, how the resurrection was the key, the New Testament makes a direct or indirect mention of the resurrection many times. The resurrection is the cornerstone of the gospel. But what is even more fascinating is we have eyewitness testimony of the resurrection. Eyewitness testimony. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the witnesses that saw the risen Lord. Starting at verse 5 of chapter 15, he says, and he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, by the way, and then to the twelve. And that would have been enough for witnesses right there, right? But he goes on, Paul goes on to say, <clears throat> and after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Stop right there. Paul is declaring in the book, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15, that the Lord Jesus, the resurrected Lord Jesus, appeared to over 500 witnesses at one time. They all can be uh, seeing an illusion at the same time. The resurrected Lord Jesus Christ appeared to over 500 hundred brothers and sisters at the same time. He says, some still are living, though some have fallen asleep. So in other words, Paul said, if any witnesses are reading my letter right now and want to go question some of the witnesses, they're still living right now. You can go talk to the witnesses right now. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last, he appeared to me also as the one abnormally born. Now I do not want you to underestimate how important the statement of what Paul has just said. He's declaring that over 500 people saw the Lord Jesus after he rose from the dead. Now, if you were at a trial and someone said, I have over 500 witnesses to prove my case. I believe that any jur jury who's not completely biased would say this fella got a lot of evidence here. Uh, what would you like to call? I like to call 500 witnesses. <laughs> Matter of fact, over 500 witnesses. I like to call to the stand to testify about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody would say he got a strong case. Well, some people would say, I can. How can we know if the Bible is, is telling the lie with, Paul, with the Apostle Paul wrote? I'm glad you asked that question. Well, even skeptics acknowledge that the book, 1 Corinthians uh, was written around 56 or 57 or even 58 AD. That's just 23 years after the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So 23 years after Jesus has been uh, has risen from the, the grave, there are some witnesses still living right now. Paul write this letter. Now, if he was telling a lie, they could have went over there and said, boy, you done lost your mind, Paul. Here, here we, let's go examine his witnesses. So you, you, you want to know why it's important that the book was written around 56 or 57 AD? Because the witnesses are still alive. That means somebody can go talk to the witnesses. So there should have been some writings around the time that Paul is stating this, saying that I, I, I examined Paul's evidence with the witnesses and we found out he was lying. That didn't happen. They said, we got to kill these boys. We got to shut them up. We got to suppress the truth. They should also have evidence to prove that they went over to the grave and located the body. But what we see around this time in history is leaders and so-called important people attempting to cover up the evidence. 
They didn't disprove what the apostles were saying with all these eyewitnesses. They said, we need to shut these people up. Because they knew the evidence was credible. So you got all these atheists who wants to write books way after the fact, saying we don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Well, why wasn't nobody around the time that all these witnesses were still alive? I mean, John was still alive 80, 90. Well, we should have some evidence that you're saying, boy, that John had lost his mind on the Isle of Mepatimus. He had lost his mind. No, no, nobody would say, we're we, we going to put him on the Isle of Mepatimus because we need to shut him up. They didn't come up with evidence disproving the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ because that is our declaration of independence. They said, we're going to shut them up. We're going to kill these Christians. We're going to persecute these Christians because we got to shut them up with the truth. The same thing happens today in our society. They do not want the truth out. You are, we are living in an era where truth is offensive because anybody who has truth on their side don't have to try to cover up the evidence. Anytime you see somebody trying to suppress the evidence or shame you or embarrassing you with not speaking against the truth, all you have to do is ask them, say, show me your facts. Can I look at the evidence? If you said there's no voter fraud, can I look at the evidence? See, like in the days of the apostles, when they were talking about, let's shut these boys up. When the atheists come along, when the non-believer come along and says, we don't believe the Bible, we don't believe in the resurrection. Well, show me the evidence back in uh, that time where people was writing and saying, we're going to dispel. We even got non-believers who said, we're not going, we can't disprove the resurrection. Now, after all of the eyewitnesses are dead, they come up with these theories. Oh, that was made. They stole the body away. Jesus never really died. Wait a minute, the ones, are you saying that the apostles who were afraid when Jesus was being crucified all of a sudden gained courage and went down there with armed guards to steal the body away and they were willing to die for it? They were willing to die for something they knew was a flat out lie. Does that make any sense to you? Did this ring a bell to anybody? See, when they can't prove their points, they try intimidation. They, they try Smear campaigns to silence the truth. Listen to what persons who has the truth on their side will not suppress the evidence. Let me repeat it. People who have truth and facts on their side do not go about suppressing the evidence and saying, let's not look at the evidence. Only liars and dishonest people want to suppress facts and truth. The only people that do not want the truth to come out are those who have something to hide. The fact that the so-called leaders of that day went about to silence the apostles and the Christians tells you that it's not that the resurrection was not a well-documented historical fact. It is that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus exposed the corruption of the leaders of that day. Because no one said we can go over to the tomb that was well guarded and see the body there. We know that the Romans had the tomb guarded. So are you telling me the disciples who were afraid when Jesus was being crucified all of a sudden went over there and stole that body away? This doesn't make any sense. And why, why, why wasn't anybody... When the apostles and all of the eyewitnesses that saw the physically resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, why was it that nobody was saying, we can tell you that you fellows are lying? They were putting them in prison. They were locking them up. Nero said, let's just burn the whole thing down. So from Genesis to Revelation, the redeeming power of the Lamb of God is talked about. And the Lord Jesus predicted his death, burial, and resurrection while he was still here in Matthew 16, 21, the Bible says from the time on Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And on the third day, raised to life. Did you get that? He says, I must be crucified. I must be buried, but I'm going to raise again. 
Mark 8 and 31 says, And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. There it is again. Whoop, there it is. Luke 9 and 22 says, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day raised again. Whoop, there it is. So the reason that the critics want to attack the resurrection is for a two reason, actually. First, it would destroy the credibility of the Bible and the Lord Jesus. Secondly, it would prove that Jesus did not defeat death. And if he did not defeat death, what does that mean for the rest of us? No, my friends, he did defeat death. And his resurrection is our declaration of independence. So you should celebrate it every day. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have... Been Falling asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we of all people ought to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his turn, Christ the first fruits, and then he comes uh, uh, those who belong to him. The gospel is the good news because he indeed has been risen from the dead. So we have this hope for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made uh, with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall be found not naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, of not that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now we, uh, now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whence we are at home in the body, then we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest to your conscience. Yes, indeed, we have an Independence Day. Our Independence Day was wrought back on Calvary. When the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins, but the good news is, see, that was that's called Good Friday. Even though he was dying and, and, and suffering, we call it Good Friday because he was technically dying for our sin. And the reason that that Friday is called Good Friday, in spite of 
all of the injustice what was going on on Calvary, uh, the reason we call it Good Friday is because of what happened on that first Sunday, on that first resurrection, on that first day that he rose from the grave declaring he had victory over death. We have Independence Day because of what he done on Calvary, because the, our Father which are in heaven has accepted our high priest offering. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. It ain't like they call God by surprise and says, uh, he got to work out a new program because uh, he didn't know that they was going to crucify him. Jesus had already been talking about his crucifixion while he was on earth. Matter of fact, you can go way back to Genesis. I mean, you can work your way up through uh, Revelations. He's the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the, uh, of the world. It was God's divine plan. They didn't catch God uh, off guard. It was his divine plan. See, when we say all things work together, see, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ is our victory. The crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ is our Independence Day because he got up. If he had not got up, we wouldn't have an Independence Day. See, you're free. You're free because of what he done. You're free because he defeated death by raising from the grave. He has risen. When they went to the grave looking for him, the angels declare he is not here. He has risen. So the Christian has an independence day because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did on Calvary, but also what he did on that first resurrection Sunday. He got up. There was nothing for death to hold on to because there was no sin found in him. He is the atoning sacrifice for the sins of all those who are believers now. And we can declare this is our Independence Day because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for what your son did on Calvary, for coming and dying for our sins, living the perfect life, but you raising him up from the dead on that first resurrection Sunday. We thank you for our independence. And we are free now because of what has happened through the finished work and the shed blood of your darling son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your redemption. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that we now can have eternal life because of what he has done on Calvary. Thank you, Lord. And we ask you to forgive us for our sins. We ask you to forgive us of our shortcomings. We ask you to forgive us for being ungrateful for giving us our independence. We pray that you would touch the mind of those in the Common Sense Nation, those who are listening to this broadcast. We, are, we, we pray that you will give them the full concept of what that independence entails. We are free because of what he has done. The devil has no power over us because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he proved that you had accepted his sacrifice by him raising from the dead. And we thank you this day for that independence. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. And happy Independence Day. I hope you celebrate your independence. First of all, by thanking God for his son, Jesus Christ, who died for your sins. And secondly, those who shed their blood in a free country so that you may have of true independence. True independence is not some government or some elected officials telling you you cannot declare truth. That's not freedom. That's slavery and that's prison talk. We're free because of what he has done. We don't need to get permission from the government to speak boldly 
because we have been rescued from the grasp of Satan because of what he's done. And we should be take great boldness in the freedom that he has given us. We should not be listen, looking for permission in order to speak boldly about truth because it is God Almighty who has given us the victory. He has given us independence by defeating the works of the devil. He was he came to destroy the works of the devil and he done just that. So anybody who's telling you you cannot speak freely, evidently they're trying to put you back in bondage under the grasp of Satan. And you tell them the devil is a lie. <laughs> the devil is a lie because I'm free because uh, he said I'm free. I don't need a permission slip from the government. I don't need a permission slip from uh, Facebook. I don't need a permission slip uh, from YouTube. I don't need a permission slip from Twitter or any other entity. I'm free because God said I'm free. And I don't have to look for permission in order to be and live in fear from what a government, a corrupt, demon-possessed government is trying to tell me I can't speak freely. I'm free because the Lord Jesus Christ has set me free. And whom the Son set free, he is truly free indeed. God bless you and God keep you. Hope you have a...